Hello, today we're continuing with our GCSE physics revision series looking at gravity and satellites. In the last video we said that planets orbit the Sun and are kept in their orbit, which is actually elliptical but nearly circular, by the gravitational attraction between the Sun and the planet. So what the planet would normally do is just to continue in a straight line, that's Newton's first law. But the gravity acts as a force that pulls the planet in. So now it's travelling in this direction. And now gravity pulls it in again, so now it's travelling in this direction. And as we said, the point is that gravity, which is always pulling between the two planets, or sorry, between the Sun and the planet, pulls it so that effectively it's constantly moving in this near circle or ellipse. And I said that you don't need to know this, but essentially the force that operates between the Sun and the planet is equal to a constant, g, the gravitational constant, multiplied by the mass of the Sun times the mass of the planet divided by the distance between the Sun and that planet squared. And I said strictly it's the distance between the centre of the Sun and the centre of the planet. And that is the force that provides the centripetal force that keeps the planet orbiting the Sun. So, it is the force that keeps the Earth orbiting around the Sun, it's the force that keeps the Moon orbiting around the Earth, and it's the force that keeps communication satellites orbiting around the Earth. In each case, the force is equal to this G term multiplied by the mass of one body times the mass of the other body divided by the distance between them squared. Now this next section I'm going to do is again something you strictly don't need to know, but I think being aware of it gives you an insight into how this all works. Let us just consider two people standing one metre apart. So the distance between them is one metre, and we'll assume that they each have a mass of 70 kilograms. There must therefore be a gravitational force between them, because there's a gravitational force between any two bodies that have mass. So the question is, why do these two people, standing a metre apart, not get sucked towards one another with an almighty force? Well, let's just work out what that force is. As we've said, the force is equal to g times the mass of one body divided by, sorry, multiplied by the mass of another body divided by the distance between them squared. Now, I haven't yet told you what this constant g is. It's actually a very small number. It's approximately 6 times 10 to the minus 11. So that's very small. And then we multiply that by the mass of one body, which is 70 kilograms, times the mass of the other body, which is 70 kilograms, divided by the distance between them squared. Well, they are one metre apart, so one squared is one. So that's pretty straightforward. And if you get your calculator out, I think you'll find that comes to 2.94 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons as the force operating between two people, each of having a mass of 70 kilograms, standing one metre apart. That looks like a pretty small number, 10 to the minus 7. Let's just see how small that force actually is. I want you to think about an ant on the Earth. So here's my ant standing on the surface of the Earth. Better give it six legs. Um, an ant weighs about 0.003 grams. That is, sorry, that's the mass of an ant. Or if you like, that's three times 10 to the minus six kilograms. That's the mass of an ant. What is the force that that ant exerts on the Earth? In other words, what is its weight? We learned this from uh, when we did classical mechanics. The force acting on the, on the ground, the force by which or the weight of that ant is its mass times g. And for these purposes, we will regard g as 10. It's normally 9.81, but let's keep it simple and call it 10. So the force or the weight of the ant is equal to 3 times 10 to the minus 6, which is its mass, times 10, which is g, which is equal to 3 times 10 to the minus 5 newtons. 
And that you will observe, that's the force of an ant on the earth. And that's the force exerted by two people when they're standing a metre apart. This is about a hundred times greater than this. In other words, the weight of the ant is a hundred times greater than the force that operates between two people standing a metre apart. That's why you don't get sucked into one another, because there's only a hundredth of the weight of an ant causing you to do so. And you're well able to withstand that. So if gravity is that weak, how can gravity keep the Sun and the Earth in orbit? Well, the answer is because they are massive. So let's do exactly the same formula again. F is equal to G times one mass times the other mass divided by R squared, but this time for the Sun and the Earth. So G is a constant. That doesn't change. That's still this very small number, six times 10 to the minus 11. But now we need the mass of the Sun. Well, that's two times 10 to the 30th kilograms. And now we need the mass of the Earth, and that's 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. But we've got to divide that by the distance between the two squared. The distance between the Sun and the Earth is about 150 million kilometers. So that's 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers, but that's got to be squared because it's R squared. So it's quite a complicated calculation. Uh, but if you work it out with your calculator carefully, I think you'll get the answer 3.2 times 10 to the 28 newtons. And that's a massive force, right? The force between two people had a 10 to the minus 7 newtons, absolutely trivial. The weight of an ant has 10 to the minus 5 new newtons, almost as trivial. But the force between the sun and the earth has a 10 to the 28 newtons, which is massive. And that's what keeps the Earth in orbit around the Sun. So the, the key was that although this gravitational constant is very small, the masses of the Sun and the Earth are so large that they swamp this constant and provide the large gravitational force that keeps the Earth in orbit. Now, in order to assist your understanding, I'm going to tell you something else that you strictly don't need to know. I've told you so far something you don't really need to know, which is that the gravitational force is equal to this gravitational constant times the mass of the Sun times the mass of the Earth, say, divided by the distance between them squared. That force, we said, is what keeps the Earth in orbit. In other words, it's what keeps the Earth, um, it provides the centripetal force which keeps the Earth in orbit. Now, there is a mathematical formula for centripetal force. When anything is orbiting or going around in a circle, there's a mathematical formula, which I'm not going to derive. I'm simply going to tell you what it is. It's equal to the mass of the object, which is in orbit, multiplied by its velocity squared, divided by the radius of the orbit. So in the case of the Earth, the uh, centripetal force is equal to the mass of the Earth multiplied by the velocity, the speed at which the Earth is travelling, squared, divided by the radius of the orbit, which of course is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. That is the centripetal force, but that is also the centripetal force. So those two things are equal. And you'll notice what happens, that the mass of the Earth actually cancels out. And you'll also notice that one of the radius terms also cancels out. So if you look what you're left with, on this side we're just left with v squared, and on this side we're left with gm, which you'll remember was the mass of the Sun, divided by r. So what you can see here is that the velocity of, in this case, the Earth, is dependent on g, which is a constant, the mass of the Sun, which of course for these purposes is a constant, divided by the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And whenever you've got a term in the denominator, what that means is that as the radius increases, then V squared decreases. If this term increases, this term decreases. And obviously if V squared decreases, then V itself decreases. 
So what does that tell you about the planets that are going around the Sun? Well, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. The thing about them is that as you go out, the radius of the orbits increases. This is a small radius, this is a larger radius, this is a larger radius still. So R is increasing for each planet. And if R is increasing, then V squared is decreasing, and therefore V is decreasing. So consequently, Mercury travels fastest around the Sun, Venus is a little bit slower, Earth is a little bit slower still, Mars is slower still. The further out you go, the less fast, the less fast or the slower you actually travel. I just want to remind you again of that formula that you don't need to know. F is equal to G mass of the Sun times mass of the Earth divided by R squared. But that M can be the mass of any planet, of course. It simply tells you what the force is between the two. But you'll notice that the force is proportional to 1 over R squared, right? because you've got this R squared at the bottom. So that's what's called an inverse square law. Inverse square because you've got the inverse of the radius, 1 over the radius, and it's squared. So notice what happens. If the radius doubles, then the force will go down by fourfold, right? If that increases, sorry, if this increases, this decreases. But it does, doesn't decrease proportionately. If the radius doubles, then effectively you've got to square that and the force will go down fourfold. If the radius triples, three times the radius, then the force will decrease ninefold because it decreases according to the square. Now you may remember in the previous video I told you that when comets approach the Sun they speed up and now you can see why because we just go back to this formula we derived up here. V squared equals GM over R. I'll write that down here again. V squared is equal to GM over R where V is now the velocity of the comet M remains the mass of the Sun, and R is the radius, that is the distance from the uh, comet to the Sun. So obviously, when the, if this is the Sun, and let's say this is the comet's orbit, when the comet is a huge distance from the Sun, when R is very large, V is small. So out here, it's going to be going slow, because V will be small. But when the comet gets to, say, here, the distance from the Sun, R, is small, which means V squared is much larger, which means V is large. So the comet travels fast when it's close to the Sun. All the things we've been talking about in relation to planets apply equally well to satellites that orbit the Earth. Let's say that this is the Earth, and the Earth, of course, spins on its own axis. And we might have a communication satellite, which itself is orbiting the Earth. Now, the key thing about a, satel a communication satellite is that you want it to be in the same fixed position in the sky all the time, because you're going to have a dish aerial focused on the satellite. And you don't want to have to keep moving the uh, dish around you want the satellite to appear to be above that point of the Earth the whole time. And that means, of course, that since the Earth spins once every 24 hours, if you can arrange for the satellite to orbit once every 24 hours, then the satellite will always appear to be in the same position in the sky. And we call that geostationary. So essentially the period, that is the time for one revolution for a satellite, has to be 24 hours. And again, for reasons you don't need to know, but I could show you the formula, you can find it in the A-level videos that I've done on this if you desperately want to know. But essentially a communication satellite, if it is to remain geostationary, has to be about 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface. Well, now let's consider weather satellites. Here's the Earth, and of course it's uh, 
orbiting on its own axis. But a weather satellite 22,000 miles in the air is not going to see anything of any detail. Weather satellites need to be much, much closer. And they tend to orbit around the poles. So essentially they are going this way and the Earth is going this way. So essentially as the um, satellite orbits and the, and the orbit time might only be about two hours, so that 12 times a day this satellite will orbit and essentially all parts of the Earth will be visible as it goes by. And can you remember the formula that we derived? We said that the velocity squared is equal to gm divided by r. In this case, we're talking about the velocity of the satellite is equal to the gravitational constant, which always stays the same, times the mass of the body that is being orbited, in this case, the, the Earth, divided by r, where r will now be the distance between the satellite and the center of the Earth, not the Earth's surface, the center. And consequently, since R is very much smaller than it was for communication satellites, which are 22,000 miles in the air, the weather satellite is much closer to the Earth, so R is much smaller, so V is much larger. Or V squared is much larger, so V is much larger. So weather satellites travel much faster than communication satellites do. And just out of interest, how is this communication between um, communication satellites achieved? It is generally achieved in the microwave region. Microwaves are probably the best form of electromagnetic radiation to use. They are intercepted by a dish aerial on Earth. And the reason you use microwaves is that they will pass through the atmosphere relatively unscathed. When we dealt with electromagnetic radiation, I did tell you that microwaves can be absorbed by water. That's the way microwave ovens work. So if it's raining, some of these signals might be uh, weakened. So on a wet day, you might find that your television signals are not quite so good. Um, but nonetheless, they don't absorb all. And finally, you use what's called digital signals, and we'll come to the difference between digital and what is called analog later. The point about digital signals is that they are less prone to interference. So the way it works is if you're having a phone conversation with someone in a different part of the world, this is the Earth, and here are you standing, say, in the UK, uh, you will be talking on your mobile phone and the signal will be going to a local receiver, which is probably within a few meters of you, 30, 40 meters. That is then sent to a much larger transmitter, as it were a major station, and that then transmits the signal up to the satellite, which is geostationary, so it's always pointing in the same direction. And then that stationary, that geostationary satellite will send the signal to another major receiver on the other side of the world, which will transmit it to the local station, and that will be transmitted to somebody, say, standing in the United States, who's also got a mobile telephone. So that's the principle of global communications, that the microwave signal is sent 22,000 miles into space to the uh, communication satellite that is geostationary, that sends the signal back to another major receiving aerial, which distributes it to the local um, aerial, which passes it on to you.